the term propaganda comes from the Vatican's Congregation for the Propagation of the Faith. It was about propagating the faith in the sense of getting people to join the church, to become believers in the church. So propagation in the sense, the same sense as uh, propagating plants. You grow something. So it, it, the original sense has a sense of organic changes in society. Since then, when uh, propaganda was adopted as a term for the kinds of communications that happen, especially in wartime, propaganda has become a term which mainly relates to communication, to posters or uh, political speeches or communication through the media. And one of the things that we think about propaganda, it's important to go back to the original sense. When people talked in the, the 1800s about organising a propaganda, they meant a body of people to change society. It's about trying to organise conduct as opposed to just change minds. So you, you hear the phrase hearts and minds quite often in relation to propaganda or other similar terms. And yes, it's about minds. And yes, it's about hearts, but it's also about organising behaviour in the world, in the interests of those who are the propagandists. Propaganda is organised persuasive communication which has become on some level manipulative. That it's not about persuading people, getting people to agree with you, it's actually about manipulating people. So propaganda then becomes defined as uh, attempts to deceive or incentivise or to coerce people to get them to think things that they wouldn't otherwise think. It's a non-consensual process. The term propaganda came to be used for communication in wartime, um, especially in the First World War. And it got a bad name in the 1914-18 war, especially with uh, atrocity stories about the Hun, i.e. the Germans, which helped to bring the British and the Americans into the First World War. And as a result, there were many people who saw the power of propaganda to change minds and to organised conduct, they decided that propaganda was too controversial a term and that they had to find another term. The, the father uh, of this uh, activity, Edward Bernays, came up with a new term and that was public relations. And so public relations became a term for propaganda uh, which started to replace propaganda from the 1920s onwards, but especially after the Second World War. But of course the problem with that is that um, when people start to understand public relations, they start to become sceptical of that. So there's a constant attempt to change what we call propaganda because it, it gets a bad reputation, the, the, the terms become soiled. And so there's been a whole succession of, of different terms, psychological operations, psychological war, strategic communication, information warfare, marketing and advertising are new terms as well, which are essentially all ref refer to the potential to propagate ideas and behavior in society. It's a question of whether or not deception or lying was involved in the British government's September dossier, which was produced in the run-up to the Iraq war. And primarily the conclusion which we reach in the case of, of the dossier paper is that the British government wasn't lying. It didn't claim that there was WMD in Iraq knowing that there wasn't any, but it did deceive intentionally through deception based upon exaggeration and omission of information. In an early incarnation of the September dossier, it was, it was actually known as the Four Country Paper. And it was a paper which was looking at North Korea, Libya, Iran, and Iraq. Looking at all of these countries in terms of the threat they posed because of their programs, weapons of mass destruction. And it was known as the Four Country Paper. And very early on, an internal debate emerged that, well, the problem with having a four-paper dossier is that Iraq actually looks to be the least threatening of all of these countries. So if we are trying to move, mobilize opinion to support military action against Iraq, then having all of these countries in a dossier alongside Iraq isn't really helpful here. And John Scarlett, who was the chairman of the Joint Intelligence Committee, who was overseer of the dossier, 
and we have him in an actual email saying this, actually states very clearly that perhaps the government should think about removing the other three countries because that would have the benefit of obscuring, and he uses that word obscuring the fact that in WMD terms, Iraq really isn't that serious. So that's a very good example of a mission. So you have a dossier, well, we don't want the public to know about those other countries because then they're going to simply ask the obvious logical question of, well, if you're so concerned about WMD, why are you going for Iraq and not going for countries which are, have got far more significant WMD capability according to the intelligence. The core of this paper is what has come to be known as Report X. Report X was essentially a piece of uh, subsourced intelligence given to a source on trial which said we know somebody who knows that Iraq is currently accelerating production of chemical and biological weapons and this person will provide the evidence within three weeks. And that was Report X which suddenly came onto the scene a week before the dossier was published. And this was seized upon by people involved in the dossier and used in order to take the intelligence, which was essentially saying, well, we think there's probably a WMD capability, but we can't say for sure. That intelligence was taken, and, and you can obviously, from my description of it, you can see how flimsy that intelligence was. That intelligence was taken and used in order to transform the dossier to state very clearly that Iraq was currently producing chemical and biological weapons. That's clear use exaggeration of the overall intelligence picture in order to make the dossier more persuasive and to take the threat from a possible future threat, which is really what the intelligence was saying, into an immediate threat, which the government could then make the case that well, we need to take action now. One way in which you are in non-consensual communication is through the use of deception because people are not making informed decisions because they've been lied to. But another way in which there's non-consensual communication is through the question of coercion. And I want to give you a very, very clear example of that. When uh, Western states uh, are engaged in invasions and military operations, such as, for example, the invasion of Iraq in 1991 uh, and in, again in 2003, the US and the UK, they drop leaflets on those countries for the local people. In the leaflets they say, we will bomb this area soon. Either you will be a target of that bombing if you don't remove yourself from here, or if you leave here, we will spare you. Now that's understood as propaganda, but it's clearly coercive propaganda because it's, mean, it's, it's meaning of those propaganda leaflets, getting people to surrender, is underpinned by the very real threat of military force. And so people are being persuaded into surrendering, etc. But it's not just the propaganda message itself doing that work, it's also the fact that you have you know, credible deployment of US military force. And that's a form of coercion. When you start to theorize propaganda in terms of organized persuasive communication and you bring in all of these different ways of organizing conduct, you start to see potentially how widespread these activities are. And ultimately, you know, very serious questions are raised about the level of consent which is operating within democracies. When you have, even before you get to the realm of incentivization and coercion, even if you have a culture which accepts spin, exaggeration and omission, which is actually primarily a form of deception, if you have a culture which sees that as natural and acceptable, etc., then you know, you've got widespread deception occurring. And if you have widespread deception occurring in the context of a democracy, you don't have genuine consent going on. This is clearly a non-consensual process. When you then add to the mix the full range of incentivization and coercion, which can go on as well, then the world starts to look far less consensual and very undemocratic. And that's the, the major issue, I think, underpinning all of this.